Hi everyone and welcome back to Snippet Sports Science, proudly brought to you by EliteForm.com. With Jared still on his well-earned break back home, I've actually found an old podcast that we haven't released yet. So for those people who probably prefer to listen to Jared's insightful comments rather than myself, you get both of us today. Enjoy the podcast. So today we're going to review the paper Improving Strength and Power in Train Athletes with three weeks of occlusion training by Christian Cook, Liam Kilduff and Christopher Bevan. Welcome, Jared. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Jared's here too. <laughs> You're a funny man. So <laughs> the, the point with this paper is most articles that deal with BFR focus on low loads of 20% of 1RM. The thing I like about this paper, it looks at rugby union players at using 70% of 1RM. The exercises that they used here are bench press, squats, and pull-ups. Five sets of five reps for three weeks. When you really look from a start, it has huge applications to strength and conditioners out there. So this is a pretty unique study in that they actually use a high load with the blood flow restriction training. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's my point. It's really nice to see that they've gone away from the bulk of other papers out there. So I thought it was a really good paper to start with in that strength coaches can see the pure application to the cohort of athletes that they would normally train. Sure. So tell us a little bit about the rationale for this study, Chris. As I alluded to, in team sports such as in rugby, there's short-term training blocks to enhance aspects of functional strength, especially in season, the ability to be able to continually perform high load strength training and try to gain strength in season is quite hard because of the demands of sport, in particular contact sports such as rugby union. So when you look at BFR, resistance training with low loads, 20% of 1RM, is perhaps the majority of articles that are currently out there in literature. We've already alluded that activities such as walking have elicited significant improvements in knee joint strength and leg muscle size. And and also BFR training has been associated with acute increases in growth hormone, decreased myostatin, and also the exercise with the BFR elicits increased acute metabolic stress, such as lactate and cortisol, activation of mTOR signaling pathways. When you look at this paper, being able to put this into an elite training population with a gym session that they're able to relate to from a performance aspect, I think that's great application. It's, it's hard to be lifting 20% of your one repetition max and feel like you're really doing something, especially when you've been accustomed to years upon years of lifting very heavy to then suddenly go in and only have 50 kgs on the bar. Definitely. And when you look at the sport, say rugby union, you've got big props packing in, you know, the 130 kilos in body weight. If you're only squatting 50 kilos, there's not a huge lot of stress. And imagine going to a scrum going, oh, what have you been squatting? Oh, I mean, you squat 240. What do you squat? Oh, 50 kilos. But I do BFR. So when, when you kind of even think about that, just the confidence when you're going into a competitive situation, knowing that you are strong is very important. However, understanding that in season, these guys are pretty beat up. If you can keep the load in your training, but just decrease a little tiny bit, I think has huge benefits from an athlete's um, application in a gym session. Right. And preparing for that contact is actually something I talked with Adam Story a bit when, when I had the interview over there that there's a lot of eccentric loading that occurs during the contact. And so in order for you to appropriately prepare for contact, such as in rugby, you probably need some heavier loads to get that mechanical damage and more appropriately prepare for it. That's a great point there, Jared. Let's look at the methods. Oh, well, they recruited 20 male semi-professional rugby union athletes. They were on average 21 years old, 184 centimeters and 95 kilos. So not small guys. They were all from the same club and had at least a minimum of two years of resistance training experience. So divided into two groups, they try to have a similar grouping with age, body mass, height, and plane position. They initially did an eight-week resistance training block to achieve that initial functional strength and power gains that they normally focus on during pre-season. So you know they actually had some training leading into it and that the BFR or the control wasn't the factor that actually improved their performance. What they initially did, they had their strength testing where they performed leg squats, did a traditional warm-up up to a 1RM, and then they then did this in a bench press on a, on a 1RM. So they performed about three maximal attempts to determine their true 1RM. 
on the second day of testing, they did some power and speed. You want to delve into that one for us, Jared? Yeah, that testing consists of three maximal effort unloaded counter movement jumps with the arms akimbo. So that's the hands placed on the hips. That's a great word, akimbo. Akimbo is actually one of my favorite words. I remember using it once with my uh, with my mother when I was about thirteen, and she was, <laughs> she, was she was astonished that I knew the word akimbo. Fantastic. And then they perform five sets of forty meter maximal sprints where the best sprint time was recorded and performance maintenance was calculated based on the change in sprint speed from the first to the last sprint. In other words, sprint one time divided by the last sprint multiplied by 100. The two groups were then randomly assigned to one of two training interventions in a counterbalance crossover fashion. Each training block was three weeks long and included nine experimental resistance training sessions. So the standard training consisted of three exercises, leg squat, bench press, and weighted pull-up at 70% of their individually assessed one repetition maximum. Five sets of five repetitions were performed with 90 seconds of rest in between the sets and three minutes of rest in between the exercises. The BFR training protocol was identical to the standard training, as Jared described, except that the lower limb blood flow was restricted with an inclusion cuff width of 10.5 centimeters to 180 millimeters of mercury. The cuff was only inflated during exercise and was deflated during the inner set and inner exercise rest periods. In other words, intermittent occlusion. So as opposed to most studies where the comparison is between a higher loaded resistance training or low intensity resistance training and then blood flow restriction training at low intensity, they've maintained the high intensity for both the standard training and the blood flow restriction training. It makes this a very unique study. Definitely. So when you look at the total stress, you've got a high mechanical and a high metabolic stress during this session. Saliva samples were also collected before and after the first experimental training session of each week. In particular, saliva was sampled in duplicate for testosterone and cortisol. In total, 12 samples were taken per participant. Off to the results. What did we see here, Jared? So between the two interventions, they found that the blood flow restriction training intervention showed greater improvements in both the bench press and the squat. We saw 1.4% greater improvement in the bench press and a 2% greater improvement in the squat. There were also improvements in the maximal sprint time and the counter movement jump power. They did mention the occlusion intervention significantly improved performance maintenance in the repeat sprint test by 0.74% compared with the non-occluded intervention. So these are fairly small percent improvements between the non-blood flow restriction and the blood flow restricted one ranging from about 0.4% up to about a 2% improvement. But we know that those are competitively significant improvement percents. And then what do we see with the testosterone and cortisol changes? The main observation here was the large to very large increases in testosterone observed in response to the BFR training sessions. The effect size here was 1.5 to 2.2 in comparison with moderate increases in response to the non-occluded training, where the effect size was 0.73 to 1.2. And those are quite large effect sizes, especially over just a three-week period. It'd be very rare in training studies to see over just three weeks you'd have an effect size of over one. And when you delve into previous work from Cook, one of the main driving factors which you're trying to actually achieve in strength training is actually improvements in acute levels of testosterone. If you're able to do this and improve it by the addition of using BFR on top of high-load training, I think there's a really good advantage here for athletes out there. Overall, significant associations were also observed between the mean acute salivary T response to exercise and leg squat strength, bench press strength, and counter movement jump power production gains. So it's interesting that we've been seeing those responses with the the squatting and the bench pressing, but not the weighted pull-ups as well. So that could be some sort of reflection on the on the fiber type or something about the type of exercise. Definitely. And traditionally in those type of athletes, they really enjoy their squatting and their bench pressing and possibly the chin-up stimulus just may not have been enough. Right. Absolutely. In contrast to the testosterone data, specifically the increase in cortisol during the blood flow restriction training session fell from almost certain in the first week with an effect size of 0.6 to only possible in the third week with an effect size of 0.2. And across the three-week block, the pre-exercise salivary T concentration was observed to significantly increase from about 120 to 130 picograms per milliliter across the training blocks, while a non-significant decrease was observed in the same time period when no occlusion was applied. 
So we're seeing acute but longitudinal changes in tea concentration. Once again, something we really want to try and get with these type of athletes. Right, and that's something we've seen in other literature as well, is that there's a chronic increase in the growth hormone. Whereas some researchers have criticized this endocrine changes as being only small and transient in response to exercise, what we're seeing somewhat consistently in the blood flow restriction literature is that you can actually have chronic increases in hormones such as testosterone and growth hormone. So we think that this is, this is a very novel application that a lot of people have really overlooked with blood flow restriction training is they think when you do blood flow restriction training, you're supposed to just do low intensity, and that's not necessarily the case at all. You could very well be doing moderate or higher intensity resistance training. In summary, Jad, what do you think about this paper? Well, you know, I was actually relaying a lot to how we've been doing the isometric blood flow restriction training lately, because I, I thought about that, and it's actually very high intensity work often even more into if you do a maximal isometric it's technically higher intensity than a one repetition maximum and so we're sort of skipping all the way over from where most people would be doing 30 percent one repetition maximum or less with blood flow restriction training and we're actually going over one rm concentric and doing maximal isometric work with our blood flow restriction and that could be a relatively unprecedented level of intensity and that's something that no one has explored. I think there's no studies on isometric blood flow restriction training. We've actually done it, and I've got another athlete as well who has a patella tendonitis as well. And we've been using isometric training as a, a training stimulus for the muscle fibers, but also the isometric work has been shown to be quite good on for tendonitis. Doubled with that, the BFR has actually been shown to be quite beneficial for tendinopathies. So putting that all together, we've actually had a really good response with this athlete performing isometric work using blood flow restriction. He finds it quite tough, and we've been alternating it with the cuff on, cuff off, using it as a potentiator for the first set. And within a four-week period, we've gone from about 3,000 newtons to 4,000 newtons. Wow. So a really nice response in quite a short period of time. And this is a, a young athlete, young developing athlete where we can perform an isometric movement quite safely because we can control his position as opposed to, say, a 1RM squat where he has many more factors technically to have to control through the whole movement. Right. And that, that really is an incredible intensity. For those of you not familiar with Newtons, 4,000 Newtons would be very roughly equivalent to a 400 kilo lift. Definitely. And for, for a young athlete to ask on one leg, and this is a single leg isometric squat to push 400 kilos, yeah. a little alone a 400 kilo leg press, I think would be pretty amazing. And here there are people thinking that we need to do blood flow restriction training with just the bar. And we've always spoke about that BFR is you need to just open your mind to different methodologies and find ways to incorporate it into your own practice. I think it, as time, practitioners look too much towards literature and say, well, literature says we have to do A, B, and C. But they don't look at E, F, G, or maybe even Y and Z to the far extreme and to see how they can incorporate into their own practice. Therefore, as I always say, and as Jared says, we encourage you as practitioners to get out there and, and to experiment and, and to be a master of these type of tools in your own environment. Right. I think we should definitely be doing evidence-based practice, not evidence-restricted practice. Definitely. We should use that the evidence as a foundation for being able to do more rather than do, doing less. Perfect. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on today's podcast. We hope you've enjoyed that one. Also, thanks to EliteForm.com. Please check them out. They've got a really cool new time under tension function on their system. Also, check us out at Snippet Sports Science, and please leave us a review on iTunes. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.